Hello and welcome to Good Morning UK, Have Your Say, a Force for Goods mid-morning show coming to you live from our nerve centre here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. And this is the place where you can get some respite from the craziness of the week. Because here we are British, we love the United Kingdom, and we want to stay together, and we work to stay together, and we join people from all over the land with those aims as well. And thank you to everybody who's coming in already. Linda, always first on the button from Southeast London. Good morning, and TC also. Hello, Karen. I hope you're well, and great to see Stephen watching in as always and Alan also and James good to see you guys back here and Bill morning to all on a bad week of politics says Bill we're going to be talking about that because that is uh, here in Scotland of course the big issue with Sturgeon being essentially let off the hook well let's let's talk about that and good to see Debbie as well I hope you're well Debbie Derek Good to see you, Derek. And Samuel, Samuel, we must have you on the show, actually. I was thinking I'll contact you later about that. Nelson, good morning to all the other fellow unionists all over the world, because we do exist all over the world. If you're British, you're involved regardless of where you live, as we always like to say. And Tommy from Loyal Coat Bridge. Ian from the Wirral, good to see you again, Ian. Glad you're in. And Tommy was disappointed with James Hamilton's decisions as he doesn't believe SNP have the UK's interests at heart. Well, that's certainly true, isn't it? And Sandra, good to see Sandra. Hope things are well over your side of the country. And Graham says Jimmy Cranky must go. And Dottie from County Tyrone, good to see you coming in again from County Tyrone. Dottie, always good to have you on the programme. And, you know, the <laughs> let's talk about Nicola Sturgeon just straight away. Let's get that one off our chest. Now, yesterday, the Tories had a motion of no confidence that was defeated. And what was interesting was that Labour and the Lib Dems abstained. OK, so here's here's a question for you this morning. Was Labour right to abstain from the vote of no confidence in Nicola Sturgeon yesterday? Obviously, all the SNP and all the Scottish Cabbage Party people rallied around her, as we have come to expect. The flowerpot man, the wonky vegetable who leads the Scottish Cabbage Party, he was very forthright in his love for uh, Sturgeon, and slender man Swinney was simping away about his love for Nicola as well in a rather disgusting uh, display of um, white knightery, basically, uh, about how Sturgeon was absolutely so wonderful. Oh, man. And all the SNP people are going, oh, what a great speech, Slender Man. You've done so well. You haven't scared the children tonight. Well done. And But what was it? It was just like, Sturgeon, I worship you because you're my goddess or something like that. It was really embarrassing to watch Slender Man doing it, really, quite frankly. Anyway, so all the usual suspects were debasing themselves at the throne of Nicola yesterday, including, as I say, the Flowerpot Man and Slender Man Swinney. And um, so that's to be expected what was not perhaps to be expected was the extent to which Labour and the Lib Dems, remember them, they've got five MSPs, um, they abstained. Why did they abstain? Why do you think they abstained? Were they right to abstain? Or should they have stuck it to Sturgeon, really, and said, we have no confidence in you? Um, interested on your thoughts on that. Good morning, Eileen from Abingdon. Abington and Sue from Cornwall and Jane 
Jamie from sunny British East Lothian. Fantastic. David from Loyal Perth. Unionism must stick together country before party. Good morning from Mid Calder. Stephen says, It's now clear only the Conservatives are standing up for Scotland. What do you think of that? That's a thought. No live chat on YouTube, Alistair. Yes, there is. There should be live chat on YouTube. Can somebody please check on that? Um, I'm getting a message about YouTube. I'm wanting to check on that. Just bear with me. Um, there should be things should be okay there, but we'll we'll just uh, work on this. Um, that kind of threw me there. Um, no, live chat's working. Uh, it seems to be working fine on on YouTube. <clears throat> okay, so where was I? Where was I? Sorry about that. Um, Graham, Le Graham says, Labour have delivered an election win to the SNP in May 2021 by abstaining. The thing with Labour is that they have to get in hard, okay? They have to get in hard on that. If you're going, if you're Anna Sarwar, for example, and you're standing against Sturgeon, you've obviously got no confidence in her, so you should be able just to say that out loudly. We have no confidence in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have uh, Debbie. We've got we've got all the comments are all turned on 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 YouTube. Uh, we always check that initially just to make sure we've allowed all comments and enabled live chat. Um, so they've got to stick it to them hard. And the thing with Labour is that they they're fearful of seeming to side with the Tories on anything because the SNP always hold them to that. You know, the Tories are the bugbears. They are the, the bogeyman of Scottish politics, according to the SNP frame. So anybody who's associated with them is automatically a Tory. Oh, we don't like Tories. And so Anas Sarwar tries to distance himself from the Tories, which is, I can understand that, you know, but it's um, he needs to develop his own frames and he needs to go in hard uh, against them because a lot of us... You know, with this tactical voting thing, a lot of us are looking for a reason, any reason, to vote Labour. So they've got to hold out something that suggests that they're going to stick it hard to the SNP at this election on all these matters. And they shouldn't be agreeing with the SNP on anything, quite frankly. Who do we vote for? Well, do you know what, Ronald? I don't want to tell you that. Uh, that has to be a personal decision at the end of the day. All I can say is don't vote for the SNP and don't vote for the Scottish Cabbage Party. Beyond that, uh, a force for good is not going to recommend that you vote for anybody in particular. Some people may want to vote tactically. Others may not want to vote tactically. We're not going to come out and say vote for this, definitely. I know other people are doing it. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. If you want to come out strongly on one position tactically go ahead and, and, and do so but we're just uh, we're just going to leave it to people's own opinions on that here's uh, uh, David has got an interesting thing my view was the Conservatives went in early they should have waited till the report was published but Labour and the Lib Dems should have voted and not abstained yeah fight is over we now need to convince the electorate to vote tactically says David it's an interesting thought. At the end of the day, the only people who are going to deliver the vote of no confidence, the real vote of no confidence, is going to be the people of Scotland at the ballot box. OK, at the ballot box. That's where the, the proper no vote of confidence comes in. And to those SNP people who are out there who naturally are not happy with the SNP. And and I would say to you, just if. If you're not happy with the SNP, just don't vote. If you in your heart cannot find it to vote for anybody else, just don't vote. 
because I know the SNP has let a lot of SNP people down, especially with their anti-free speech laws, which go against go against Scotland's history of freedom and the, the, the mythology of Scottish freedom as well. And the, the uh, Humza's hate crime anti-free speech law goes against that whole culture of free speech that we Scots are meant to stand by proudly. So the SNP have really let many Scots down. And so if you're SNP, just and if you can't bring yourself to vote for any other party, then just don't vote. That's my advice to you. Steve believes the, the Tories are who you must vote for. And Linda there, just a wee point on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, please do smash that, that thumbs up button because that really does help to get that video seen more widely as well. So please do uh, thumbs up and subscribe to us on that. Uh, but Graham makes an incredibly good point. Whatever you do, don't, if you're a unionist, don't not vote. You have to vote um, if you're a unionist. Anyone but the SNP, use your vote wisely, says Brian. And Robin says that Scotland must eventually be cured of the outdated moronic sickness of Tory hatred. That's that's so true. It's 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 a sort of um it's a bane on Scottish politics that that hatred which is developed against the bogeyman. Um which, you know, who started that? That was Labour that started that, okay, because they thought that was to their advantage, and that's unfortunately come back to bite them on the backside, that one. Now, talking about voting, we got this through the post today, uh, yesterday, the Scottish Parliament Election Voting Guide, and it just reminds us to remind everybody that if you're not registered to vote, you need to get registered by the 19th of April. That's Monday the 19th of April. And if you want a postal vote, then you need to be registered for that by the 6th of April. So, I mean, that's coming up pretty fast now, folks. That's coming up very fast. And you can get registered. You can get registered at gov.uk forward slash register hyphen to hyphen vote. Okay. And if you've got friends or colleagues that you know are unionists, right, make sure that they're registered. Maybe you've got uh, children or friends or mates who are on our side but go, oh, I'm not registered to vote or I don't vote. Make sure you try to help them to get registered because we do need every single vote because that is the that is one of the problems with unionism in Scotland is that so many people don't vote and so many people don't even vote at the Scottish elections, you know. It... If the Scottish elections breach 50% of the entire electorate at any election, we're doing very well. It's usually just around about 50% turnout at Scottish elections. It's very, very poor. And interestingly, the turnout at Westminster elections are far, far higher. There's far, far greater um, turnout in Scotland at Westminster elections, suggesting that the Scottish electorate is far more engaged at the British level than they are at the Scottish level. And this is proven. In the last five British general elections, the average turnout was 66%, okay, two-thirds of the entire electorate. In the last five Holyrood elections, the average turnout was 53%, okay? That's a whole... 16% less engagement and uh, we we've got these figures in our union heart which is uh, available at uh, available to all union supporters that's union heart which is our occasional magazine we've got a fourth issue coming out this summer which is going to be a 24 maybe even a 36 page special edition which will go th free to all union supporters that is monthly donors who request it okay let's go back to the comments now <laughs> 
Alex is so true. What use is the flowerpot man, the wonky vegetable, Patrick Harvey? Without Sturgeon, he'd be unemployed. And he'd be unemployable. He'd be unemployable. Okay. And Tommy says, I don't believe the Labour Party were correct, but they put their hatred of the Conservative before the sins of Nicola. And Dottie wonders if they took the cowardly option, no backbone. <laughs> Did Sawa fall at the first hurdle by supporting the hate bill? Unfortunately, the Labour people do not have a good record on the hate bill. There was only a few of them who actually abstained or chose not to vote uh, last last week or two weeks ago when it was. You know, folks, today is actually an auspicious day in British history. We as unionists, we venerate several important days in our in our history. And today, one of the days that we venerate as unionists is the Union of the Parliaments when Scotland and England came together on the 1st of May 1707. But a lesser known date, which is also part of our British Unionist history, is today, which is the 24th of March. For it was on this day in 1603 that Queen Elizabeth I died and the throne of England went to the Scottish king, King James the Sixth of Scotland, who was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. And thereby he united the thrones of Scotland and England in what became known as the Union of the Crowns on this day on the 24th of March in 1603. And it was, it was he who began the process of not just uniting the throne, but also uniting the politics of these islands. And during his time, he was a man before his time, and he wrote and he advocated widely on British political union. However, he was a hundred years before his time, and the English Parliament of the day was simply not up for it, and they didn't really want these meddling Scots from up north to be bothering in their business down south. So, but he was a man before his time, but he set in train the what would eventually become the Union of Parliaments and what would eventually become our politically united kingdom. He united it in his body regally and a hundred years later thereabouts it became united politically and it's been united politically ever since. So it was on this day, the Union of the Crowns, 24th of March, 1603. And it's something that needs to be better known, really, at the end of the day. Needs to be better known. Now, he was also a man who wanted... He could see the problems between the Scots and the English that had been developing and had always developed. And he saw it as his destiny to try to to try to get rid of that conflict. And he wrote very cleverly and wisely on these matters. And he didn't want to be known as the James VI of the Scots and James I of the English because he thought that was divisive. He wanted simply to be known as King of Great Britain. And that is how, that is how he is remembered in the King James Bible, which he created on the King James Bible, which he created. And if you look at the frontispiece of that, it says James, King of Great Britain. And he also passed a, a, an, a, a royal proclamation, which I'll just read out to you here. Um, I'll just bring it up as well. And he said... 
Wherefore we have thought good to discontinue the divided names of England and Scotland out of our regal style, and do intend and resolve to take and assume unto us in manner and form hereafter expressed the name and style of King of Great Britain. Yes, love that, love that. So he was uniting the nation in the body of himself, as it were. And that was, he was a man before his time, a man before his time in the sense that the actual political expression of that did not come in for another hundred years yet. But we do venerate James the Sixth of Great Britain as as a powerful unionist. And of course, it was James the Sixth of Great Britain who also who set up the plantation of Ulster, so-called. It was he who set up what we now know essentially as Northern Ireland. And it was also he who set up the plantation in North America, which began to populate North America with British people. So he was a real uh, important king, not just for the United Kingdom, but indeed for, for the world. And it was on this day, the Union of the Crowns, that he that he took on the the English throne. So that's this day in British history, which we always remember. And, you know, the Scottish nationalists will go, oh, and some, some people, some historians will go, he's not James the Sixth of Great Britain, he's James the Sixth of Scots and James the First of England. Well, what a clumsy way of having to describe somebody, you know. He was the Sixth James in the realm, in the territory which became the realm of Great Britain under his leadership. So he was James the Sixth of Great Britain, just as Elizabeth the Second is the second Elizabeth in the territory which has become the realm of the United Kingdom. So James the Sixth of Great Britain is how we style him and it's a perfectly a perfectly good way to style him. And I just want to uh, bring up another picture here of this guy, which you know that I obviously like a lot. And it is this, which I was delighted to discover a couple of years ago on the roof, on the, sorry, on the ceiling of the banqueting hall, which is a royal palace in Whitehall. And that is a painting by Rubens, and on the right-hand side is James the Sixth looking down on a little baby that's being crowned. And the little baby is Great Britain in its infancy. And one of the women there is Scotland and the other woman is England. And they're placing the crown of Great Britain on this baby's head. So you're looking at James the Sixth there watching the crowning of the infant Great Britain. Uh, a very amazing piece of artwork which is on the ceiling of the banqueting hall, which is the royal palace, which you can get entry into at normal times, which is on the on White Hall. Anyway, that's our day in British history. A great day, an auspicious day for all us fantastic unionists. And we'll be asking a question about that in our competition, which will be coming up in a few minutes. Uh, here we've got people speaking about the flag proclamation and the flag law. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain that one in a minute, Robert. Um, it's it's a, an interesting development this week. An interesting development. Now, well, let's talk about it right now. The... British government has said that the Union flag must fly all year on British government buildings. Now that's excellent, excellent news and not before its time and hopefully that will get rolled out throughout the United Kingdom, okay? Um, there is a little bit of uh, um, a footnote though that has to be added here. And that is that British government buildings in Scotland 
are different from so-called Scottish government buildings. Okay, Scottish, what they call Scottish government buildings, which we call Scottish administration buildings, are controlled by Holyrood. Even though they're devolved British institutions, the, the say-so over them wrongly goes entirely to Holyrood. So whoever controls Holyrood can do whatever they want in these Scottish so-called government buildings. So your Scottish government buildings are not required to fly the Union flag at all. And Nicola Sturgeon's writ runs there. So she decides what flags fly from the Scottish government buildings, the misnamed government buildings. And she, of course, as we know, has decreed that the Union flag must not fly on any buildings under her control, except on Remembrance Day for now. OK, disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful, because these buildings are all devolved British institutions in Scotland. All of these buildings owe their life and their financing to the British Parliament and to the British taxpayer. And so every single one of these so-called Scottish government buildings is a devolved British institution and it should certainly be required to fly the flag of the United Kingdom, of the country that gives it its institutional life. Anyway, be that as it may, be that as it may, this edict here is not for the Scottish government buildings. It's for the British government buildings in Scotland. And to be frank with you, I was thinking, what exactly are they? You know, OK, you've got those, there's a small, there's a Scottish office, which is the Queen Elizabeth Hub at Waverley. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what other British government buildings are left in Scotland these days. Um, there's not that very many that are direct British government buildings. I'm not talking about council buildings. I'm not talking about Scottish administration buildings. I'm talking about British government buildings. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this is good. This is good news anyway. And it shows that we're moving in the right path as far as uh, thinking about the union is concerned. Because these are very easily done things which have not been done hitherto. And that's why we've ended up where we end up with the Scottish National Party in such domination of our culture. Exactly because exactly because they they understand the power of imagery. And imagery is what it's all about. Politics is all about imagery. It's all about imagery. I mean almost imagery almost comes first and actually um you know, words come second as far as politics is concerned. You know, that look at our background here. Uh, last last week, I think it was maybe this day last week, um, there was a... Robert Jenrick was a, a British... is a British uh, cabinet minister, and he was on one of the BBC programmes, and the two presenters were kind of taking the mick a bit from him because he had one solitary Union Jack flying in the background, OK? So we we sent a message. We sent a message to the BBC and said, "Look, if you would like anybody to come on to comment about Union Jacks in the background, okay, I can think of no better person to do it than ourselves here at A Force for Good, because we are the world's experts on placing Union Jacks in the background as much as we possibly can, as much as we possibly can." And there's my wee badge as well. My wee badge as well, get that in there. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm seeing, and there's an eighth one. There's an eighth one. So we've got eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that nine? Anyway, we're getting them in there, if you know what I mean. And so nobody, nobody's under any impression, any misimpression about where we stand. Ah, there's the Andrew Peters, the passport office. And the benefits office are both government buildings. That's true. That's true. Um, good. Good. Excellent. Adam says, get this chat filled with UK flags. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, Samuel there says, I should have mentioned that in my video regarding that subject. Um, Samuel's got a YouTube 
channel there, Samuel. Send in the address of your YouTube channel and I'll give it uh, a quick mention. Um, other good things that have been happening. Um, no, before I go to that, top of the hour, the competition. The competition is for uh, this little tin of mints, okay? And if you have the answer, please send it. I'll give you the question in a second. Send in your answer by email to contact at aforceforgood.uk. Now, this day in British history, the 24th of March in 1603, was the Union of the Crowns when James the Sixth of Scotland became James the Sixth of Great Britain after Elizabeth the First died. Now, this tin will go to the first person who sends in the right answer to this question, which is, who was James the Sixth's mother? Okay, who was James the Sixth's mother? Okay, that's a fairly straightforward one. And this is going to the first person who sends in that answer at that address. Contact at a force for good dot. UK and the winner will be announced at the bottom of the hour. Fantastic. Now, yes, the other th good piece of information that's coming out of um, the British government is that a new cabinet office base is to be set up in the great British city of Glasgow which we're very pleased to note. In um, the Queen Elizabeth Hub has been set up and is opened at Waverley in Edinburgh, and there's a new one planned also for Union City, Glasgow, which is wonderful. The A UK government flagship hub with room for 3,000 civil servants has opened in Edinburgh and there are plans to use new legislation to directly fund and run new infrastructure projects in nominally devolved areas such as transport. So that means spending, again, direct spending directly into things in Scotland, going over the heads of the Scottish National Party and the Scottish Cabbage Party. Because as we know, if you give them any money whatsoever, they will simply take it without thanks and then they will pretend that they never received it okay so there's no point in giving them money and expecting to get any credit for it if you've got british taxpayers money that you want to spend in scotland you have to spend it directly directly from the british government through the scottish office into scotland that's the way that it worked prior to 1999. And guess what? It worked very well indeed. And in fact, it built everything around us today. And so it's easily done, and it can be done a lot faster and a lot quicker by direct spending, rather than giving it to Hamza Yusuf or others to simply flush down the toilet. And a department spokesman here is saying as a department with a key responsibility for the union it is appropriate that we move to strengthen our presence and commitment in scotland well thank you thank you for that not before time a source told the newspaper that the proposal would quote bring the engine room of the uk government to scotland exactly and it makes people see britain in action Okay, it makes them see it in action. So let's hope that this government hub in Glasgow is going to be centrally placed where people can see it, like down on the Clyde, for example, or uh, in the centre of Glasgow itself. We don't want it out in the sticks, okay, when nobody can see it. It has to be, like, emblazoned right there down the front of the Clyde, okay, somewhere like that, where we can see it every day, and where people travelling into Glasgow can see it and can look up 
and see the Union flag flying. You know, for many years, the first thing you saw when you came into Glasgow on the train was on the left-hand side, there's a casino. And it had these massive letters saying casino on it. And that was the first thing that you ever saw when you went into Glasgow was this building with the word casino on it in massive letters. And it's just, how did that get planning permission? I have no idea. And But that's been reduced now. I think it's smaller or they put a different name on it or something like that. But what we need to be seeing is coming into Glasgow on the train, great big Union Jack flying there, emblazoned across the windows, the Union Jack. So people know they are now entering the Union City of Glasgow, the great British city of Glasgow. Because we, after all, were considered a city of the empire, a very prominent city of the empire. Indeed, after London, Glasgow was named the second city of the empire. And so we have a great British history that the Scottish nationalists will, will, will do down and pretend that doesn't exist. And to the extent that they look at it and try to pretend that it exists, they will try to dump all over it to make us somehow awkward about talking about it well those days are gone and in the past they must remain because we are moving forward now into a great future for all of the united kingdom and it's going to be even better if we can start getting these people out of Holyrood. and that's what's going to be happening on the 6th of may when we are going to purge the sturge we're going to give humza the heave we are going to get slender man swinney in that big binny and we're going to make Angus Robertson the soon-to-be-forgotten one. Okay, okay. Exactly, Robert. Ten billion sent to the SNP. Where is it? What have they done with it? Very good question. Very good question. And Graham chimes in there with the SNP are thieves. And right now we've been watching all these thieves running out. Bill says, are you doing any activism during the run-up to the election? The all under one banner people are going to be having a static demo, probably in George Square, but we're keeping an eye on that. On the 1st of May, Saturday the 1st of May, we will certainly be doing a counter static demo to that. So please look out for that. And uh, we, we're preparing for it already. We've bought a new microphone, um, a really powerful microphone. Uh, I don't have it here with me, but I was like, what kind of microphone should we have to uh, to work our PA system? And I thought, well, I, my mind went straight away to, well, what microphone does Lemmy from Motorhead have? Because that's the energy that we're talking about here. And that was a sure SM57, which we've got now, which we acquired for the office, and that will be making its first appearance in George, probably George Square on the 1st of May. But stick with us, folks, because all of that's subject to change during these difficult times. As far as April is concerned, I personally am going to be doing activism every single day, but more on that later. TC says Glasgow is indeed a very important British city. Absolutely, and British it shall remain. Well, Stephen, absolutely. The SNP are quiet on any kind of investment by the UK government. As I say, they will take it, any money you give, they take it without thanks. They'll misrepresent it as their own largesse. And if you insist that it was from the British government, they'll pretend that it, they never received it or that it wasn't enough. They're just... They're just... Uh, it's just mental to give money to your opponents, your, your, your true political opponents, and believe that they will represent your generosity in any way is the height of insanity. The height of insanity. <laughs> Robert says the Empire Theatre in Glasgow, yes. Thankfully, there's other elements of the Empire which are still left as well and, and, and still with us today. Well, absolutely, Bill, thanks for standing up to the AUOB. That's all under one banner mob. 
Anybody who wants to stand up for the first time, please do so. We haven't had a guest on this week, but we're going to have a guest next week who's a wonderful woman who has stood with us on the thin red line several times. And uh, no doubt she'll be telling you what a great a time that is, you know, when, when you're standing in solidarity with all of us unionists. So any people who want to join us, do make sure that you send us a wee message to contact at forceforgood.uk if you haven't been out with us before. If you've been out with us before, you'll, you will be told about it. Uh, we will contact you if you've been out with us before. We'll be keeping you in the picture on that one. Uh, Andrew asked a question there that I don't know the answer to. Maybe other people will. He says, what's the outcome of Peter Murrell allegedly refusing to hand over the finance books looking into the missing 600,000. Has this just been swept under the carpet? I haven't been following that story, Andrew. I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. I don't know the answer to it. Do you know, we have a massive box here of filings that go right back to 2014 that I always work through each week. I try to get as much of it filed and noted down and put into order as possible. And I had the misfortune to read a speech from Nicola Sturgeon this week, uh, which is actually from two years ago. And it was uh, an, a, a, an article that she wrote for The National. And I was reading this, and I thought it was very telling, because she was, she was talking, as she does, as if Scotland's already independent. And she was saying to her readers, and this was came out just before the party conference, and she was talking about how if Scotland uh, b broke away and was separated, uh, the amount of money that we would pay back for the debt that would be owed to the rest of the United Kingdom. And she said something here that really just, I thought, you're the cheek of you to say this, right? She goes that it would be reasonable to pay money back um, for any debts that were owed it would be reasonable to, to pay back, you know, the proportion of the national debt that was owed to the rest of the United Kingdom, because this would recognise the fact that the rest of the UK will always be our closest friend. And I thought, the cheek of you, right? When do you ever talk about the United Kingdom or the rest of the United Kingdom being our closest friend, OK? For you right now, your rhetoric is all about the rest of the United Kingdom essentially being our enemy. But oh no, oh no, once we're separated, you're going to start talking about the rest of the United Kingdom being our closest friend, are you? The cheek of you, lady, seriously, seriously. But this is the rhetoric that they come out with and you've got to be tuned into it to see it. Yeah, the rest of the UK is always our closest friend. Well, if it's our closest friend, what are you doing, Nicholas Sturgeon, campaigning to break it up? You know, cheek, absolute bloomin' cheek. And this fits into an article that we wrote on our website uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was about how separatism will never, ever satisfy the Scottish nationalists, OK? Because... They like to tell you that if Scotland, uh, yeah, a separatist work is never done, is what we called it. And they like to tell us that if Scotland broke up, then guess what? Scotland and England are going to suddenly become great friends. And it's Scotland and England mainly that we're talking about here. Of course, everybody else is involved, but this, the Scottish focus is always on England, essentially. So it's oh, we're going to become great friends. And, you know, there wouldn't even be a need for the Scottish National Party anymore. Well, that's wrong on so many levels. What, in fact, would happen, as we explain in that article, a separatist's work is never done, is that far from Scotland and England becoming friends, the relationship would become ever more tense and fraught and in fact, it would become worse. Okay? It would become worse because what would inevitably happen is that if you had an independent Scotland, then essentially the rest of the United Kingdom would fall apart in short order. And England itself would develop a new English parliament. 
And quite naturally enough, this new English parliament would be seeking to assert itself in opposition to what remained of the British Parliament. And it would look upon what remained of the British Parliament with contempt in the way that the Scottish Parliament at the moment looks upon the British Parliament. And this would create a tension which would result inevitably in the English Parliament winning that battle because it would have so much power over so many things in England that the British Parliament effectively no longer had any power over. So the British Parliament would become redundant and there would be no need even for a British Parliament and Northern Ireland, Wales and England would all split. And so you'd be back to where we were, basically in the days of James the Sixth. You would be back to the situation that he recognised, which was the English Parliament was so powerful in these islands that the best way of ameliorating its power, the best way of controlling it, was in fact to have a wider British political entity where all the smaller parts could be involved and to the extent that they could, they could control its direction. And you would have all the British parts rubbing along as best as they can. And of course that came to pass and that's the situation that we're living in at the moment, which is definitely the best option because once you have a powerful English parliament, which again, is dominating these islands in the way that it did prior to 1707, then the Scottish-English relationship is going to become a whole lot more tense and fraught, and it's going to become worse, and everybody is going to start contemplating the Scottish naval. All the English people will be contemplating the English naval. Nobody will be looking at the big British picture. And we always talk about a big British pond, which is where we can all swim about. We can all swim about the big British pond. And to the extent that we don't like others or don't want to be associated with others, we can give them the swerve. We can give them the swerve. But when you take us out of the big British pond and you put us all into our little goldfish bowls, then all the fish just start eating each other. So, so we don't, the separatism will not solve it. Separatism is not the solution. If you're looking for good relationships between all the different people of these islands, then the best way you can do that is within a united kingdom where we can all swim about and we can avoid each other if necessary. It's not to set up essentially four or five different parliaments on these islands where we're all fighting each other and where the English Parliament is going to dominate to the anger of the Scottish Parliament. That's only going to make matters worse. And federalism as well would go down that route. Federalism would would essentially end the United Kingdom as well. That's why the Labour Party are so wrong on federalism. They're so wrong on it because they don't understand history. And the Scottish nationalists don't understand history as well. And we made that point. You know, the Scottish nationalists don't want to accept that there was a very good reason for the Union in 1707. There was lots of good reasons. But one of them was to enable Scotland to, to control the power of England, to enable Scotland to, to, to control the power of England in order that all of the United Kingdom could move forward together as one with, so that the, the English Parliament wasn't completely dominating everything. That was one of the reasons that the Scottish Unionists saw at the time for the Union. They saw the chance to exercise power in that way. Um, and, this, and that's a very good reason, but the Scottish nationalists don't want to accept that. So they come out with all sorts of crazy nonsense, which is not correct, about bribery. Oh, yeah, all the Scots just decided to take the shilling, and that's why we've got the Union. You know, as if the Union was born in some kind of immorality. Well, that's not the case at all. The Union was born for very good political and economic reasons. And these political and economic reasons were real then, and they are real today. And they're still needed today as much as they were needed then. Yeah. 
Alan's interesting here, going back to the, the, the election, Labour and Conservatives should step down their weakest candidates to for, force a vote against SNP. That's I've I've seen some people saying, for example, that uh, the Tories should stand down in in uh, Glasgow South Side, where Anas Sarwar is contesting Nicola Sturgeon. And you know, if he beat Nicola Sturgeon, she probably wouldn't be re-elected again because she's number two on the region list, and there's a very good chance that the SNP are not going to elect anybody on their Glasgow region list, or if they elect anybody, it may just be one candidate that they elect. And it wouldn't be Nicola Sturgeon, because she's at number two. So if Anas Sarwa beat Nicola Sturgeon in Glasgow Southside, which is not impossible, nothing is impossible, then Nicola Sturgeon would not get re-elected to the Scottish Parliament. I mean, that's... That is one area where I think we possibly would advocate tactical voting because that would be just that would just be fantastic. And you know, a lot of the SNP people who voted for for Nicola, they should they should just try the lot with an ass. You know, maybe he's maybe he can be better for you as well. So so that's uh, it's Alan makes a point about maybe the Tories and Lib Dems standing down in. Uh, in Glasgow South Side to see if Sturgeon can actually get beaten because if she gets beaten she's not going to get back to the Parliament and that would be an amazing turn up for the books and let's not pretend that's impossible let's 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 believe let's believe that we can purge the Sturge yeah if he beat her the SNP would crumble absolutely it would crumble and see this is why an ass has to come out hard against her you know he shouldn't be dilly dallying no fooling around Man, you just come out, you say, the SNP are wrong on all of these matters. Um, oh, oh, just, yeah, he could do it if he wanted to, but he's invested so much with them already, like he voted for their anti-free speech law. He refused to say that he had no confidence in her. I don't know if that's the right attitude, really. Anyway, time will tell, time will tell. Oh, somebody says there. Uh, somebody says that uh, what happens if if uh, Sturgeon wins? Should we just accept it? Absolutely no. I mean, if Sturgeon wins and if they uh, if they get another if they get uh, another SNP majority, we just have to deal with it. We just have to stop them from breaking up the United Kingdom because the direction they want to take us in is going to be very bad. So we just have to hold the United Kingdom together, and we can. This United Kingdom is strong enough to hold together, and there's enough good arguments to keep it together. The way it works at the ballot box, though, doesn't always reflect the way that the people of Scotland feel. As I was saying earlier, the turnout is so low. The turnout is so low. So if we can get the turnout out, if we can get the turnout up, then there's all these people who can who can vote against Sturgeon and who can vote for the other parties. At the moment, we're suffering here in Scotland from such low turnouts at the Scottish elections. Here in in the Glasgow Pollock area, where Hamza Yusuf is contesting, you know, the turnout was was below fifty percent in twenty sixteen. Okay, it was forty five point eight, forty six percent. It's four percent below half. That's how these guys are getting in. It's because nobody's turning out to vote. It's a cry and shame and a terrible reflection upon a lot of people. So we need to get that turnout out, okay? We need to get them up, get these numbers who vote up. Oh, gosh, absolutely. You know, folks, um, some people just ask, them, what, can I get this wee badge? This wee badge is available from the shop. If we put our shop link up there, please, and the wee badge link up where you can get that. Uh, It's the new Union Heart badge. Um, Our our, our shop is... Let me just... just, uh, It's aforceforgood.uk. 
shop. There you go. Forceforgood.uk forward slash shop hyphen one. Okay. That's where you can get this this We Union Heart badge, which says a force for good through the middle of it. Now, have we got a winner of our competition? Um, we do have a winner. We do have a winner. Um, glad to see. The question was who was the who was the mother of James the Sixth? Who was the um, who on this day on the twenty fourth of March in sixteen o three became the King of Great Britain? And we do have a winner, and that person is. Debbie, <laughs> congratulations, Debbie. This little tin of mints will be winging its way. I think we we had a wee glitch there. We should be back, though. Everything should be back. So congratulations to Debbie for for um, winning that. That will be going to you today. And folks, please do share this if you're watching. Please do share this. Well done, Debbie, says Maggie. Hill says, great, Debbie. Sandra says, not again, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie's one of our great supporters. Tommy says, congratulations, Debbie. Tommy Scott says, congratulations, Debbie, well done. Stephen Stephen says, congratulations, Debbie. Well, I've got a feeling you're going to be enjoying these mints as well. Woohoo. Everybody's got good wishes for Debbie. Congratulations to this week's winner, Debbie Beer. And yes, of course, the answer was Mary, Queen of Scots, which Debbie, which Debbie got there. Good, good. Yes, please, please, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to us and hit that bell for notifications because we really need to get those numbers up. And we'll be backing up this video. This video is going to stay up on YouTube and we'll be back backing it up on our Rumble channel and also on our BitChute channel, which we use simply to back up our videos. They'll be getting backed up on those channels tomorrow. So if, if you are on Rumble or BitChute, Please do give us, uh, please do give us uh, a mention there, and of course also a wee book for the union, which is here. We're selling several of these a week, and if you want a wee good story about the union, which includes things like what we talked about today, the union of the crowns, then please do check that out also on our shop. What do we say about the union of the crowns in here? We have a whole page, the Union of the Crowns and the Union Jack, because of course it was also it was also James the Sixth who designed this wonderful flag as well. So there was no end to this man's talents, no end end to that man's talents. I'm telling you, good for him, good for him, folks. 
an hour has come up. We're going to have a guest next week and we'll have a guest the week after as well. Weren't able to get a guest today. But if you know anybody who should be on here, please do tell us. Uh, send us a message at contact at forceforgood.uk and we'll see if we can get that person on. So please do give us suggestions for good guests that might want to appear. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. It just remains for me to say, we're, Bill says, how many subs are you up to? We're up to about 1,200 now. Uh, sorry, 1,000. Yeah, almost 1,200. Glad to say. Yeah. Tommy says, thank you again, Alistair. A highlight of the week. The wee book is an excellent buy. Thanks for the plug, Tommy. Thank you. And thank you for your support, Tommy, as well. It just remains for me to say, folks, God bless the United Kingdom and God save the Queen. See you next week. <laughs>